Good afternoon. It's nice to see each of you with us. It is hopefully been a wonderful Thanksgiving for everyone. We had a nice time as our family, and we had our Thanksgiving. We ha hold it here at the church in the Fellowship Hall, and we had a delightful time. I'd like to call your attention to the announcements on the back of the bulletin. Tomorrow there is a volunteer meeting for a night in Bethlehem. If you are volunteering for a night in Bethlehem, Please be sure to be there or speak to me following the service. Also, a night in Bethlehem is coming up on December 10th. There are cards at the back of the sanctuary. We'd love for you to get them out to people, to invite people. It's an event we've held a few times. It is a journey where people go to different places throughout the building, representing different parts of the night that Jesus was born culminating with a live nativity here in the sanctuary. It's a nice event, and it's a wonderful family event. It's not just for children. It's for children and families. So please get the word out. Also, we have our annual Christmas movie night, which is Saturday, December 2nd. And we have next Sunday following worship on Sunday, our fellowship time in our fellowship hall. The other thing is we do have a few tickets left for White Christmas. White Christmas is performed at Massasoit Community College. If you are interested in tickets, there is a sign-up sheet in the entryway. There are five seats left. They're $20 per ticket. We sit together as a block from our church. The program sells out. It is a very, very nice program held at Massasoit Community College. It's not just a community college who puts it on. It actually is a community theater run through the community college and our own Mark Rochateau, active in our church. He is the director of it. Now I'd like to ask you to open your bulletin and let's join together in our call to worship. Then I will praise God's name with singing and I will honor him with thanksgiving. For this will please the Lord more than sacrificing cattle, more than presenting a bull with its horns and hooves. For the Lord hears the cry of the needy. He does not despair his imprisoned people. Praise him, O heaven and earth, the seas and all that move in them. And let us stand. remain standing and turn to hymn number 16.
and please be seated. I invite you to join with me as we pray together our unison prayer. Thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for blessings over us. Thank you that you are able to bring hope through even the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you are always with us and will never leave us. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us for when we don't thank you enough for who you are, for all that you do, for all that you've given. Help us set our eyes and hearts on all you afresh. Renew our spirits. Fill us with your peace and joy. We love you and we need you this day and every day. We give you praise and thanks for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. And we do take time to lift up the prayers of our congregation. It is nice to have Elizabeth back with us. She was ill last week, and in our prayers, it's good to have you. We continue to hold you in prayer. Names of others we should lift up today? Yes. Paul and Robbie. Thank you. In our family, we had a couple of people we had been lifting up, Jan, sister-in-law, and Steve, brother-in-law. Both of them are not related to each other. They're also brother-in-law and sister-in-law to each other. They both had heart procedures and both did extremely well. Jan had triple bypass surgery, and um, Steve had an oblation, and they're both doing well, and we appreciate the prayers. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this time of year as we gather and the days start growing shorter. And there's less sun and it gets cold outside and we're reminded of the ways in which you work through all of creation. Because sometimes in our lives it feels like things are cold and dark. And that's okay to have those times of quiet and thinking and contemplation and reflecting. We know that you're always working to bring about life and growth and new life, and for that we give you thanks. We give you thanks also for answered prayers, for the names we've lifted up, be with them, for those that we've held before you and seen your hand in bringing about healing and health. We thank you for our church this time of year as we have had families celebrate Thanksgiving and are getting ready for Advent and Christmas we pray that we could have a special celebration of knowing that you alone are God and that your son Jesus was sent into this world to be our savior, to be one of us, to give his life for each of us. And so these are prayers we lift before you in the name of Jesus as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you came this afternoon prepared to make a contribution to God through Faith Community Church, we remind you, you can always use our offering boxes or go online to faithcommunityma.com and use our Donate Now button. And now we take time for our offertory.
Father, we pray your blessing upon these, our gifts of tithes and offerings. May all that we do be used to bring about your kingdom in our world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing and join with me in the singing of hymn number 595, Living for Jesus. Please be seated. Our scripture lesson for this afternoon is the conclusion of Paul's letter to the Colossians. We'll be reading from Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. 
If you use your pew Bibles, you will notice that we have our pew Bibles that are now with us. And again, thank you for the Connors for donating them. You will find that on page 989. It is from the New Living Translation. Dickius will give you a full report about how I am getting along. He's a beloved brother and a faithful helper who serves with me in the Lord's work. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. I'm also sending Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people. Antichius will tell you everything that's happening here. Aristarchus, who is a prisoner with me, sends you his greeting, as does Mark, Barnabas's cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Jesus, uh, when we call justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers. Among my co-workers, they are working with me here for the kingdom of God. And what a comfort they have been. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship, and a servant of Christ Jesus sends you his greetings. He is always praying earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect. Perfectly confident that you are following the whole will of God, I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, my beloved doctor, sends his greetings, as does Demas. Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters in Laodicea and Nympha and the church that meets in her home. After you read this letter, pass it on to the church at Laodicea so that they can read it too. And you should read the letter that I wrote them and say to Ar Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry that the Lord gave you. Here is my greeting in my own hand. Paul, remember my chains. May God's grace be with you. nothing more formative for me than Sesame Street. In fact, my very earliest memory in my entire existence was my second birthday when I was in the basement and surprise for little two-year-old David, Big Bird comes in and Big Bird comes all dressed up and into the basement and terrifies me. And congratulations, that's my earliest memory. But it was not just Big Bird and the characters, Oscar the Grouch, and I loved Grover. Grover has been really minimized in recent years. I loved Super Grover. But really, when I think of Sesame Street, I think of the songs. And it's interesting because the defining Sesame Street song, whatever that is, you can kind of tell how old a person is. So for some people, it's Rubber Ducky, right? Sing it with me. Rubber Ducky, you're the... Right? Okay, I got... See? We got... We clearly have some, some baby boomers in the room because you all know Rubber Ducky. For me, my favorite song, and you might say, I don't remember that, but it was an early 90s Sesame Street song. It was, who are the people in your neighborhood? Tell me who are the people in your neighborhood. So they go through it. For example, and everybody was part of your neighborhood. That's what was so transformative and important for me as a little kid is I was in a family, and it's so easy to really hunker down in our family systems and forget everybody else. And the Sesame Street song taught that, no, like a nurse, I'm picking on, we have a nurse here. A nurse is a person in your neighborhood, right? A pastor is a person in your neighborhood, etc. And it was really transformative for me because it reminded me that everybody who's part of your neighborhood matters. Now, I bring this up because Sesame Street the Gospels, and the words of the Apostle Paul all deal a lot with the idea of neighborhoods and community. What you're going to see is that Sesame Street helped children grapple with an important concepts like what is community, how is it built, and who's included. So if you're dealing with Big Bird, Big Bird is kind of the child character. Big Bird is asking all these questions. Well, what is a community? And the grown-ups explain to Big Bird what's happening. 
well, how is it built and, and who's included in it? If you look through the Gospels, this is the number one thing they're always, well, the other thing is the religious people are always getting mad at Jesus because he's like actually living out his faith, but that's separate. So the number one question he always gets is essentially like, who's my neighbor? Who's part of the kingdom of God? Who's in? What does it mean to have community? What are the rules? How do we build it together? And as we've read through nine weeks of the Paul's letters to the Colossians, we've really seen these are big themes. You know, who's in? What does it mean if we're building a community to have new life in Christ? What sort of things do we avoid? What sort of things do we bring into it? And so what I want to show you is that if you think of neighborhoods, sometimes we hear this idea of the kingdom of God, and we say, I don't know what the kingdom of God is. You know, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. He's saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. And I'm like, hmm, I don't have a king. I, I don't live in a kingdom, and that's not really a concept for me. But maybe I have a neighborhood, or I'm familiar with the idea of a neighborhood. So what I want to show you is that one of the ways we look at the kingdom of God is as God's neighborhood. And I want to show you that everybody's invited to be part of it. And as we go into the Christmas season, you're going to hear a lot of things about, like, who's the true meaning of the season? What's the reason? You'll, you'll hear people say, especially on social media, hey, Jesus is the reason for the season, which is true. And that means there's an opportunity because even if we feel like Jesus has been taken out of Christmas, it's still called Christmas. The word Christ is still there. There's opportunity. There's opportunity to share our faith during the Christmas season. And God wants me to lead others to his neighborhood, specifically to the gate. And you could say, what? Well, Jesus says very clearly in John's gospel, hey, I'm the gate. I'm the gate. I'm the gate not only for the sheep, but to the neighborhood. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to go into the Christmas season and simultaneously to conclude this letter that Paul's writing and to say, wow, there's a lot of issues in the world. There's a lot of hurting people. I have faith in my life. I'm part of Jesus' neighborhood. I know that Jesus loves every single person and everybody's invited in to God's neighborhood and so what I have the opportunity to do is in gentle ways, in kind ways, in relational ways, to share my faith. And this is our big idea because I want to give you a bad idea. Because here's the flip side to it. If we are not living as Christians where we're being intentional and trying to, in our words or actions or lifestyles, whatever is appropriate, to be sharing our faith, very quickly we block the gate, Jesus until we think it's time to open it. And the problem is, is again, Scripture's super clear on this. Lost people need Jesus. What is the meaning of life? His name is Jesus. That's the reality. I want to, in my life, live understanding that I am second to Christ, that I have an opportunity to serve Him, to allow my actions, my attitudes, my lifestyles, my relationships to conform to Him. It happens over time and to bring others in and to say, hey, come join me on this journey. Because if not, what easily happens is I say, hey, you know my friend? Yeah, my friend's not a Christian, and my friend's kind of a jerk. And I know my friend's kind of a jerk, and I'm just going to kind of say, you know what? Not my problem. And I block the gate, and I give up an opportunity not to bang someone over the head with the Bible, but to say, wow, you, my friend, sometimes get grumpy. I have a Christmas event I'd like you to invite you to. Do you want to come with me? And then wait and see what the answer is. Or to just, next time my friend is really struggling, say, hey, would it be okay if I just maybe was praying for you during the week? There's easy, simple ways to share our faith. Now you're going to say, okay, that's great, but what about this letter we just read? So Paul's writing to the Colossians. And it's funny because... Did you notice there's all these Greek names that no one can pronounce? Okay, there's, there's Tychicus, we think. 
I, I had to literally go on YouTube and type in his name and figure out how to pronounce it. And even then, my dad and I are pronouncing it differently. It's hard to pronounce. And this section, do you notice, it doesn't have any real plot. There's no real action. It's just a whole bunch of people send their greetings. And then there's greetings sent to a few people. And then Paul reminds you he's in jail. And then the letter's over. And so one preacher, my dad, actually said, you know, David, this is sometimes the kind of text I would just skip over. Like, maybe there's not really plot. Sure, like, you can preach it if you really want to, but I don't necessarily know if I'd advise it. But here we are, and we're going to see what we're going to do with it. Because I want to show you that Paul is sending... Greetings from various Christians. And we have to remember when this letter was written. This letter is written not very long after Jesus ascends to heaven, just a few decades later, which means that every Christian that Paul is writing about did not get born into the faith. They had to go from an unchurched, unchristian person to being brought in by somebody. Wow, okay, that's interesting. So that means that every person in this weird text actually represents a kind of person that I might meet in my neighborhood. Every single person here, you're going to see, you're going to run, we're going to look at three of them. You're going to run into Tychicus's, you're going to run into Onesimus's, and you're going to run into John Mark's. And you're going to say, wow. In fact, you're going to see that these three that we've picked, probably like 90% of the people we know fit into kind of roughly one of these three types of person. And these are common people we meet in our neighborhood, and we have the opportunity at Christmas or any time of the year to share our faith with them and to say, hey, wow, you know, I love Jesus. You could love Jesus too. Now, maybe you don't want to say it that way, but we have an opportunity to share our faith with these people, and I'm going to show you that. Now, as you're looking at this, I want you to remember, I've, I've made little graphics and you'll see at the end. I want you to remember, though, that I'm not saying that everybody is cookie cutter. I'm going to refer to one person as the honor student, one person as the iceberg, one person as the overextender. But I want to remind you that when we're dealing with people, we're not dealing with a blueprint, we're dealing with people. So you'll notice that there's certain key themes and patterns in relationships that we have. And I want you to watch for those and see when you run into people that kind of fit into these categories, okay, how can I share my faith with them? So the first one is Tychicus. So if you go to the very beginning of the passage, it literally starts with his name. Tychicus is a beloved brother and a faithful helper who serves with me in the Lord's work. Have you ever encountered people who have it all together? They just have it all together. What do we call them? Sometimes uh, in high school, they're kind of like the athletic person wearing the varsity jacket, right? Okay, and then, you know, when we get older, they're the successful professional. They just have it together. They dress well. They speak well. Okay. Then sometimes it's a really gifted musician. Now, this is one I threw in there because I wasn't the world's best practicer, and I wasn't the world's most gifted musician, but there are some people that they get up there and they just jam, and it's just like, wow, your grandson, right? Okay, the person with it all together. And then sometimes you can say, well, a really devoted parent, and especially in our times of social media, we see the devoted parents or the people want to present as the devoted parents on social media, right? And they do the perfect Thanksgiving Instagram post, and everything's amazing. Now, it's interesting, these people exist in the church and they exist outside of the church. When we're thinking of these people in society, because Tychicus, before he was Tychicus the Christian, the beloved brother and faithful helper, he was just Tychicus, the person who didn't know Jesus. And what we're led to assume is because when Tychicus, every single time in the New Testament he shows up, he encourages, he brings people together, we assume that this is just kind of our person who has it together. I like to call them this, the honor student. I like to say that our honor students are really people who are, they're well-liked, they have a good reputation, they have a good skill set. We encounter them all throughout life and culture, but 
they have some insecurities and they have some fears. What's one of the fears? If you're someone who you seem to have it all together and people watch you and people notice you, you can be worried about, wow, are people going to see me as one-dimensional? Like, I just do this one thing. Like, I, I read this thing about this kid in like Chelmsford this past week who just scored a perfect score on the AP chemistry test. And immediately in the article, he's literally talking about how people are surprised that he, like, does other stuff. Because if you're the honor student, people just start to see you as one-dimensional. Then... Some other things is that you can feel like you're an imposter, that you just don't really belong, or you can feel this pressure to keep maintaining things, and I must work harder, and I must work harder. So there's a lot of pressures and fears. In fact, I would say that the greatest insecurity that an honor student has is this person might say something like this, hey, do they only love me because I do blank? You know, do they only love me because I'm a great business leader? Do they only love me because, you know, I really lead the team at work? Do they only love me because I'm the one everyone relies on? Tychicus is a beloved brother and faithful helper who serves with me in the Lord's work. But before they meet Jesus, here's a hard truth. Sometimes it's a lot easier to pretend and say life is all good. If we meet these people in society, in our neighborhood, you can, you can see them and sometimes these people we have the hardest time relating to because it's just like this wall, right? It's just like, hey, I got my life together, so life is good. You know, I have struggles, but I'm not going to talk about them. The good news is the gospel means that not just the honor student and not just me, but we all struggle. We all struggle. We all have sin and yuck and all sorts of things in our life that, that we would like to say don't exist. Do they exist? They do. We all fall short. We all need Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. And so when we're getting to know the honor student, you say, it's not that you bang them over the head with this, but we just work with them to say, you know what? Yeah, I, I'm a Christian, and I don't have it perfect. I'm a Christian, and I love Jesus, and that doesn't mean my life is amazing at all times, but by God's grace, I try to just be more patient and more kind and more loving. Now, I want to give you an example to make it real of a really famous honor student. There's this really famous guy, and you know what his name was? His name is Billy Frank. You've heard of him, right? Billy Frank. Oh, yes, you have. You know, Billy Frank was a smart, good-looking, 16-year-old farm kid from North Carolina. And at the urging of his friend in the 1930s, he went and he heard a preacher named Mordecai Ham. And... At, a, he, at the age of 16, at an altar call, he gave his life to Jesus. And then our friend Billy Frank, you know, he was a good-looking kid, really handsome, uh, really well-liked. In fact, in his high school yearbook, he wrote the following quote, My hopes and plans for the future are to serve God and to do His will as a minister of the gospel. Our friend Billy Frank, we know him better as Billy Graham. So here's my point, is that you never know when you're just like in your neighborhood, like who are some of the honor students in your life? Because sometimes the people that we just assume they all have it together, they're waiting for us to invite them to church to give their life to Jesus to become Billy Graham, right? Okay, don't need to oversell it. Let's go to another one. So there's the first one. Let's talk about this next guy, Onesimus. So what about the people who not necessarily who have it all together, but the people with a story? You know the people. Let's look at this. Here's what it says in, in verse 9. I'm also sending Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people. So who was Onesimus? If you are a Bible scholar, you know that Onesimus actually has an entire letter devoted to him. The letter of Philemon is written to Philemon from Paul on Onesimus' behalf. Because Onesimus, even though he's depicted here, as a faithful and beloved brother, he's the kind of person with a story. He's the kind of person that when you get to know, he doesn't necessarily share everything because he's kind of guarded and hesitant and, and not sure if you're going to accept him. Why? Because Onesimus in the first century was a runaway slave. And Onesimus meets this guy, Paul, 
accepts Jesus and now has this problem. Paul is a Roman citizen and Onesimus is an illegal runaway slave. We've got this, this problem now. Onesimus is, is looking at this and he's like, we have a problem here. I've got a story. And if, and if I share my story, we're going to have major repercussions. But because Paul is Paul, Onesimus does eventually share the story. And we get the letter of Philemon where Paul says, hey, I'm sending Onesimus back and don't now receive him as a slave. Receive him as a beloved brother in Christ. And so you're seeing that Onesimus is willing to be honest about some of the things in his life, his story. And those people exist in our culture. There's people, not that we have runaway Roman slaves, because we're in a totally, totally different culture. But what we have is we have people who I like to call the iceberg. Because what do we see with an iceberg? An iceberg, imagine this is water level, you see this much, and there's all the rest going on. You know, you see a person and they're really guarded. What could they be like? Uh, they could keep others at an arm's length. They could have kind of a traumatic background. They could be really cautious with people. I call them the iceberg. They have challenges. Like, they can say, you know, I'm really afraid of being rejected. So I'm just really guarded all the time. Have you ever met a person who's kind of a chameleon, who's kind of blend in at all times? One of the reasons people, especially people who just need, are in our neighborhood and don't necessarily know Jesus, one of the reasons they'll kind of blend in is the fear of, hey, if I don't do that, what if they find the real me? You know, they're not going to like the real me. They're going to reject me. They're going to hold something against me. The big insecurity that our iceberg friends have is this. Will they still love me if they ever learn more about me? But the challenge is, here's a hard truth they have to face. If a person is holding everybody at a distance, if a person, here's the hard truth that we see them, if a person, we, we have a slide, if a, if a person is choosing to stay distant out of fear of rejection, the problem is, is that we see that they're actually choosing self-imposed rejection, right? The problem is, is if I go through my life just always afraid of getting hurt and always afraid of getting let down and always get afraid of getting judged, I'm putting up walls everywhere and eventually I'm just in a whole series of walls and I'm separate from everybody. The good news of the gospel, and this is why we want to share the good news of Jesus with our friends who fall in this category, is that we're all sinners. We all repent, and then we build community. So the gospel isn't about, I'm a sinner, I'm so bad, I need to stay away from everyone. It's, I am a sinner, so is my friend, so is the pastor, so is the, everybody else at church. We all repent, we all say, hey God, I got it wrong, Lord, would you do a work in my heart today? It's 2023, I need you to again do the work today in my heart. And then we build the community. And then we serve together and we eat together and we get to know each other and we sing songs together and we pray together. Now, as we're thinking of this, what I want to show you is, so you can think, okay, who's an example of this? Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash was a wonderful singer, right? We love the music of Johnny Cash. Terrific guy. If you've ever watched Walk the Line, you'll notice that they present him as kind of this secular guy. The reality is, is Johnny Cash was a really sincere, really devoted Christian. He just also was an iceberg. He also had a lot of things in his life. He had a traumatic background. He had a really difficult marriage that eventually failed. He had really significant drug use. And eventually, he actually finds himself... I was reading an article. He literally finds himself in a cave, wanting not to live anymore. And he goes in the cave, and he's in there for a while, and he, he, his son writes about this. And he finds himself so isolated and so separate just from life in the cave, and then he realizes, no, actually, I don't need to be fully isolated I can return to the faith I had as a child. And he gives his life to Jesus basically in the cave, leaves, goes, drives back, gives his life to Jesus at church, and now gets involved and makes faith a major part of his life. 
Because what we see is that when someone simply stays distant out of fear of rejection, they're rejecting themselves. And if you look at the timeline of when Johnny Cash really becomes Johnny Cash, his big renaissance comes right around this time when he comes to faith again, right around the time of his divorce and his 1970 marriage. And so as we're looking at this, I ask you, like, who are some of the icebergs in your life? Who are some of the people in your neighborhood, in the community, who just hold everyone at arm's length? Think about them. What can we be doing to reach out to them? And then there's a final category, and that's the person who's really busy. Because, let's be honest, in our culture today, yes, we have the kind of social media, Instagram culture of I'm going to act like my life is perfect, the honor student. We have the people who really put up walls and isolate. But the more I talk to people in ministry, in the community, I'm hearing that there's really, there's really one big issue of December of 2023, of this decade. It's busyness, isn't it? This is, this is the all-consuming thing, like, like busy, like it's, just, it's this monster that I'm just feeding. And it's just like I'm busy, and then like I don't want to be busy, so I do something else to not be busy, and now I'm more busy. And then I try to get out of everything else, but I get sucked in, and it happens in my family, and, and any sort of sport or club that my kid's in, like that becomes busy, and then all these expectations, and then I've got all these things I'm invited to, and I feel guilty, and my calendar piles up, and it's just too much. Now, it's interesting, because 2,000 years ago, the world was different, but it was just the same. It's the same world, right? Different people, slightly different customs, same world, same problems. We're going to meet this third person, Mark, or John Mark. Now, what you're going to see here is it says this, Mark, Barnabas' cousin, as you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Now, even just without dissecting, the Bible's originally not written in English, it's written in Greek. Even if you just look at the way this is written, he just sounds busy. Listen to this. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Kind of sounds like a busy guy. Like, if he comes your way, like, I don't know what else is in his calendar. I don't know what else is in his schedule. But if he comes your way, just go ahead and make him welcome. Now, I want to talk to you about the people who are just busy all the time. It's hard when we just live busy and busy and busy. And this guy, Mark, is John Mark. He's one of the original kind of buddies of Paul and Barnabas. We see here that... He's actually Barnabas' cousin. Who are Paul and Barnabas? Paul's the guy writing this letter. Barnabas was the guy who kind of vouched for him and said, let's go ahead and do ministry together. They waited a long time. Then they went on a missionary journey. They brought this guy in Acts 13, Mark, with them. They go out, but for whatever reason, he says, hey, I need to leave the trip and head back to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know exactly why, but I'm going to tell you, it sounds like he's busy. He's too busy. I got, hey, I got too much to do than to just plant all these churches here. I'm busy. I got to get back to Jerusalem and take care of things. So he does. And who does it tick off? Paul, the writer of this letter. And then later, Barnabas wants to bring Mark again. And Paul is like, are you kidding me? This guy like doesn't have time for us. He's not reliable. He's a knucklehead. He can't come with us. And so Barnabas says, I, I disagree. John Mark's a good guy. And they separate. And eventually they're reconciled, and we'll get into that. But what I want to show you is that as we look at the people who are busy, I like to call them the overextender. What does it mean to extend? To keep going, right? So you can extend a vacation. Let's say you're going to go on a five-day vacation. You extend it to six. That's okay. We can splurge for an extra hotel, right? A couple meals. Budget won't hurt, right? Well, we're going to extend for two more days. Oh, that's okay. I got savings for that. Well, we're going to extend for another week. We're going to extend for two weeks. What happens quickly? I'm charging a credit card. Three weeks. What happens quickly? I'm bartering things that I brought, and I'm saying, hey, I bought this parrot four weeks ago. What will you give me for it, right? And so we get into these things where we extend ourselves beyond what is doable. That happens in life. We run into people, especially people in our neighborhood, in society, who just are overextended all over the place. And we spend money that we 
don't necessarily have, to buy things we don't need, to impress people that don't really matter, says Dave Ramsey. And we see this over and over. What are some characteristics of the overextended person? You know, they just have too much going on. This is way too much. It's just too much. What are their issues? They're afraid that their life's going to implode if they take on anything else. So they're in survival mode. There's a pressure to maintain, and eventually we see so often, and tell me if you disagree, our friends who are overextenders, we see them burn out. And it's spectacularly bad and sad. And we just, people look at it and say, hey, that was avoidable. Why did you just keep taking things on? But then we do the same thing, and pretty soon we find ourselves close to burnout as well. And so as we look at it, when we come to the Christmas season, you're going to hear a lot of people say things like this, you know, I'd love to fit in church. I'd love to fit in God. I just have too much going on. You know, yeah, I hear you that Jesus is the reason for the season. And, and I'd really like to make church part of my life, but it's just about priority number 19, and I can only do the first 15. And so we get to the point where they're overextended and overextended and overextended. Because the problem is, and this is the hard truth they have to face, if you think of your friend who's just an overextender, Here's the hard truth. When we start from busy, it sets everybody up to fail. When John Mark leaves Jerusalem and he's got too much going on, now he's on the trip with these other guys. And he's like, guys, I've got to head back to Jerusalem. I've got, I got something else that I've got to deal with. The good news of the gospel is Jesus directly contradicts this. He says, hey, you're busy? Come to me if you're weary and I'll give you rest. It's like one of the central ideas of the gospel message is that we don't have to have a good news of more of busyness. We can have a good news of Jesus. And so I wonder, who are some of the overextended people in your life? Who are they? Think about that. Now, if, if you're thinking of the, the honor students, maybe we have a couple. If you're thinking of the icebergs, maybe we have a couple. We know a lot of overextenders. This is, this is a big deal in culture today. There's a lot of John Marks, and we can have ministry to John Marks, and we can be there for the John Marks because they need Jesus, and they need a break. So here's what I want to show you. If we look at all these people, we remember that God wants me to lead others to his neighborhood's gate. His neighborhood's gate is Jesus. And now I want to take an example. So we're going to come into the Christmas season. And we're going to have this thing that we got cards for, Night in Bethlehem. We got Night in Bethlehem come up, coming up for a couple weeks. And I want you to try this. I want you to imagine that you've got some friends who you're going to invite to Night in Bethlehem. So you grab your card and you're like, okay, um, this looks like a fun event. It's in the afternoon on a Sunday. I can invite a friend to it. That sounds good. Then I want you to invite a couple people to Night in Bethlehem. And I want you to watch for the responses. Because we can very quickly diagnose which category they're in. So if someone is an honor student, and if they're just someone who's kind of like maintaining appearances and struggling to maintain, if you say, hey, I'd like you to come to Night in Bethlehem with me, they'll probably give you an answer like this. That sounds wonderful. Every year we get front row seats to the Nutcracker at the Boston Ballet, and we do a champagne lunch. And so that's just our special thing, but thank you so much. Then you don't get mad, you don't feel hurt, you just say, okay, I'm dealing with an honor student. And then you think, okay, Lord, could I be praying for my friend? You know, my friend is just doing everything to maintain. Could I just be the kind of Christian who offers authentic and accepting and non-judgmental? Then let's say you say, okay, uh, to another friend, you know, I'd really like you to come to Night in Bethlehem with me. And they give you this line. If they're an iceberg, they'll say this. If I walked into a church building, the roof would fall in. Okay, so you have a lot going on. So again, you don't get hurt. You don't get angry. You just say, wow, okay, that means that I'm dealing with someone with more in their life. So what I can do as a Christian is I can pray for them, and I can accept them, and I can not judge them, and I can see if over time I can listen to them and let them feel heard and let them know that they have a wonderful Christian friend who's not perfect but isn't going to judge them for the things that they have in their life that they think that the church will fall in if they come. And if you have a friend who's an overextender, 
they're going to give you the easiest answer. I'd love to come into Night in Bethlehem, but we already have 19 Christmas activities on 18 days, and we can't come. And again, you don't judge, but you say, oh, well, I'm glad I know. So I want to then show you a final tool. In your bulletins tonight, you'll see a little card. We gave you a little prayer card. It's called our share cards. Our share cards, that's not them, our share cards have a framework about how to share our faith without being weird, without guilting people. You can do it with the honor student. You can do it with any person. You can do it to anyone who you want to show them Jesus' love. You simply are going to start with prayer. You want to hear from both them and the Holy Spirit. So that means if you have an opportunity to like invite them to church and they're just like, no, that's not cool, maybe you, you back off and you say, this isn't the right time to invite them to church. And instead, you just accept where they are. You remember that everything is about Jesus anyhow. All of your work investment in them is about Jesus, and you expect God to work. And so I'm going to give you a challenge. You've got your share cards. We've got a couple examples of people you might encounter in the neighborhood who can be part of God's neighborhood. Now here's my challenge for you. Are you willing to pray daily for two non-Christians? If you're willing to do that, you've got a share card. During the last song, after the last song, before the last song, right now, grab it out, write the name of two non-Christians. You don't even have to diagnose if they're an honor student, an iceberg, or an overextender. You simply need to pray for them. And I'm going to invite you, hey, let's for the month of December, we're coming into December, would you every single day pray for these two people? And that's it. Let's pray together. Father God, we're so grateful for all the ways you're working in our lives. Lord, would you allow us to live out our faith in actions and to be willing to share your love with those around us? Lord, would you allow us to have the courage in December to just be praying for those who don't know you? Lord, we know that we don't have a silver bullet or a magic fix, but we do have a wonderful relationship with you. Would you make it evidently clear what the right next step is? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand and we'll sing together our final hymn, which is hymn number 282. And let's stand and sing together.
now may God, who establishes relationships with those who seek to enter the kingdom, be with you always. May Jesus Christ, who seals the covenant with his blood on the cross, bring you peace. And may the Holy Spirit guide your life, both today and forevermore. Amen.